Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, another of uh, our Asia Society Korea webinars. This time we have uh, an absolutely incredible group of rock star scholars uh, and analysts uh, for the Korean Peninsula, uh, and in particular, North Korea. Uh, I am Mason Ritchie. I'm a senior contributor here at Asia Society Korea. Today, uh, we have put together a panel on uh, the upcoming April 15th uh, Day of the Sun, which is to say the anniversary uh, of the birth of uh, Kim Il-sung, uh, the founder uh, of North Korea. Uh, this is a major holiday in North Korea, and this is a, a special one. It's the 110th, and as we all know, dates that end in a zero and a five are, for some arbitrary reason, more important than others. Uh, and so to, uh, to shed some light on what we can expect uh, from this, uh, we brought in uh, three uh, outstanding experts, Ankit Panda, uh, Andrew Yo, and uh, Dion Kim. Uh, I'll go through briefly and uh, mention a few uh, elements of their bio uh, and then go ahead uh, and, and get us started uh, with their insights uh, on what we can expect uh, to happen on April 15th. Uh, Dion Kim uh, is a Seoul-based uh, adjunct senior fellow in the Indo-Asia Pacific uh, Security Program uh, at the Center for New American Security uh, and is a columnist at the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientist. Uh, she specializes in regional issues, functional issues, uh, the two Koreas, uh, nuclear nonproliferation, uh, East Asia relations, security negotiations. Uh, she's written in leading publications like Foreign Affairs and Foreign Policy, uh, and is, of course, uh, a frequent uh, commenter and contributor, as many of you have probably seen, uh, to outlets such as CNN and the BBC. Uh, and uh, her crowning professional achievement uh, was a chapter uh, in a, a volume that I edited. Uh, I'm just kidding, of course. Her achievements are, are legion. She's super sharp, um, and I'm grateful that she's taken the time uh, from her busy schedule uh, and all the other amazing things uh, that she uh, works on uh, to come in and speak with us um, today. Uh, thank you, Duyan. Uh, second, we have Ankit Panda, uh, who is the Stanton Senior Fellow in the Nuclear Policy Program uh, at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Uh, he is an expert on the Asia Pacific region. His research interests look at nuclear strategy, arms control, missile defense, nonproliferation, uh, emerging technologies, uh, US extended nuclear deterrence. Uh, and of course, he is the author of Kim Jong un and the Bomb uh, Survival and Deterrence uh, in North Korea, an excellent book that came out in 2020 with Hearst Publishers and Oxford University Press. He's also widely published uh, in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy. Uh, and I'll just say personally, um, you know, his work in particular uh, on North Korea strategy, um, nuclear strategy, uh, with Vipin uh, Narong, uh, who's going into government um, soon, actually, uh, to force us, I think, to stop using the term government intelligence uh, in a, as an ironic joke uh, has been very important um, for my own uh, for my own work and my own research uh, on North Korea. So thank you, uh, Ankit. Also, and then last but certainly not least, uh, we have Andrew Yo, who is a senior fellow at the SK uh, Korea Foundation Chair. Uh, in Korean studies at the Brookings Institution's Center for East Asia Policy Studies. He's also a professor of politics at the Catholic University uh, of America in Washington, D.C. Uh, his uh, latest book, State, Society, and Markets in North Korea, is out with uh, Cambridge University Press. Uh, I've read it. It's an absolutely excellent contribution to the literature. Uh, he has also edited numerous other books uh, and written monographs, uh, one of which, uh, as an edited volume, I'll note, uh, North Korean Human Rights Activists and Networks. Uh, he did with the inestimable Danielle Chubb, uh, who's down there in Deakin, um, a, a super scholar in her own right. Uh, so if we can judge Andrew's character um, by the company he keeps, uh, he's certainly uh, a, an excellent person indeed. Uh, Andrew has also had so many amazing scholarly publications in International Studies Quarterly, the European Journal of International Relations, and, and many others. I, I won't belabor any more uh, the uh, incredible uh, CVs uh, of these uh, three rock stars who have uh, joined us today. Uh, please check out the rest of the Asia Society Korea website uh, for uh, the, the full bio uh, for each of these uh, three contributors today. So uh, with that uh, background and that setup, I'm going to launch directly into my first question, uh, which is why is April 15th, North Korea's Day of the Sun, celebrating the birth of Kim Il-sung, so important for North Korea? I think I'm going to turn to Andrew first, if you don't mind. 
Sure. And thanks for having all of us here, Mason. It's a real pleasure and honor to share the virtual stage with Ankit and Tuyan. Um, and so to your immediate question about April 15th and you know, why is Day of the Sun important? April 15th is, in the U.S., we think of it as tax day, but in North Korea, it's the birthday of North Korea's founding father, Kim Il-sung. And as the founding father and the eternal leader of North Korea, that is uh, Kim Il-sung's official title now, uh, Kim, uh, Kim Il-sung still remains the most important figure in the country. Now, his birthday has been celebrated as an official holiday since the 1960s, eventually becoming the country's most important holiday. But it was in 1997, on the third anniversary of Kim's death, that the April 15th holiday was renamed the Day of the Sun, or Taeyangja in Korean. Thanks for the historical primer. Dion, you want to jump in a little bit and maybe... You know, from your perspective, shed some light also on why this is such an important uh, day for North Korea. Oh, no, I think um, Andy did an excellent job uh, recapping why it's so significant. And so typically, the only thing I, th I would add is that typically they, uh, the North Koreans, they, you know, put on extravagant displays of, you know, um, sometimes military, uh, military plays, a lot, most often, especially this time too, we, we know that they're going to have um performance of the arts of various kinds, uh, the North Korean um, you know, newspaper that is geared towards the domestic audience. And you know, has already reported that they're going to, you know, they've blocked off dates. I think it's the 10th to the 18th or so that they're going to have all these festivities. Um, and so they, they really try to mark it with, um, you know, a, a big bang uh, sometimes with actual real fireworks of weapons tests. Um, and then other times for these um, significant anniversary dates, they don't, uh, they, there's, they have been some, uh, in some occasions during the Kingdom One regime that have been more toned down and silent. But because, you know, as you mentioned, Mason, in your introductory introduction, um, you know, years that every, the anniversaries that are marked by, you know, separate by five or 10 years, five and 10 years, these are significant. Uh, in both Koreas, actually. And so um, this year is particularly symbolic and meaningful to North Korea because it, many important, important dates and anniversaries converge. So it's Kim Jong-un's decade in power, so that's 10. Um, you know, it's the 80th anniversary of his father's um, birth, and it's the 110th anniversary of his grandfather's birth. And so you've got these you know, major milestone or major anniversaries converging. And so that's why we're expecting um, something more extravagant this year. There's been speculation of maybe even a nuclear test and we've seen um, activity around their uh, nuclear test sites that might suggest something might come up uh, along those lines. And there's also speculation that they might also test another ICBM. Great. Again, su super, um, uh, super uh, job of shedding some some uh, light on this, including obviously, uh, as you point out, this being the tenth anniversary of, of Kim Jong Un uh, being in power, his tenth year being in power, uh, and of course the the eightieth birthday of, of his father, um, Kim Jong Il. Uh, excellent point there. Um, we'll we'll come back to talking about um, some of the the weapons and the the parades and, and that sort of thing. Um, if I can go back to Andrew again, real quick, how does this um, celebration fit into the social mythology, um, the the propaganda um, of North Korea domestically? You know, you've written a book about uh, you know state, society, and economy. Um, you know, in North Korea, you know, maybe you can talk us you know talk us through a little bit. You know how this um, you know how this day or the celebrations in North Korea more generally. Um, you know whether that be the you know founding you know Founders Day or or you know Independence Day or the ends and the beginnings of the wars and things like that. You know how both for the Day of the Sun, but perhaps also if you want you know other um, holidays uh, in North Korea fit into the social mythology and the propaganda uh, in North Korea. Sure, Mason. I'm glad you asked that question because I know with these celebrations of the Day of the Sun we sometimes get fixated on the images like the missiles or the possible nuclear test. Uh, but there is a whole sociology behind celebration of holidays, birthdays, um, important uh, events uh, in North Korean mythology. But we got to remember that North Korea is a personalist dictatorship. That's just a fancy way of saying that, uh, the, uh, that all power and authority rests in the hands of a single individual. Now, 
part of sustaining North Korea's longstanding rule is the perpetu- perpetuation of myths and propaganda that deify the leadership. And as each generation of Kim rule becomes one step removed from the founder, it remains important to connect to the current, uh, it remains, you know, we have to connect the current political leadership to the mythologized origins of the founding father. And so that's what the Day of the Sun is meant to do. It's not just a celebration of Kim Il-sung, but it also helps legitimize Kim Jong-un as the rightful leader of North Korea and shore up his own legacy and that of the Kim family. And I, I should add that it's important this particular year, at least this particular in time, not only because of the fives and the tens and because it's the 10th, uh, it's the 10th year of Kim Jong-un's rule, but in the wake of poor economic performance and the inability of the state to provide its people's you know, sufficient public goods or services, the regime has to turn to these myths and propaganda while blocking out outside information to su- sustain its own own legitimacy. So again, there is a sociology behind uh, these uh, big celebrations, and a part of it is propagating certain myths uh, and propaganda. I should also add that, you know, in the West, we might associate the Sun King with Francis Louis XIV, but North Koreans will associate you know, Kim as the son of the nation. You know, his given name, uh, means becoming the sun. And so it's only fitting that you know, if everything revolves around the sun, uh, that Kim Il-sung is at that, the center of, of that universe. So again, that's the mythology and the, the symbolism uh, is, uh, is very important for the North Korean regime. If you like to just add real quick um, to Andrew's excellent, you know, background description, if we if I can connect what he said to the present day and to movements that we're seeing, the point that Andrew made about um, showing up to no one's legitimacy uh, on the special day or, or the, the week of festivities, um, we've, we've seen recently, for, the, for this month and um, even in February and recently that Kim Jong-un has really, you know, un and the regime has focused a lot on um, emphasizing the welfare of the North Korean people. And Kim Jong-un has been doing this, for example, by visiting you know, housing projects and, you know, giving commands and orders to do certain things delivered by, you know, the week of the festivities and, 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 so, and so forth. And so um, it, it appears that that's part of his way of, uh, you know, trying to show the people that he cares a lot, that they are his um, primary focus and priority, um, and you know, a, a way to perhaps try to um, you know consolidate like, some sort of unity, solidarity among North Korean people to continue to rally around the North Korean flag. Um, but at the same time, we're, you know, we've been seeing that um, the North Koreans are also sending another message, message to South Korea recently. By um, you know exhibiting a hardline um, approach, um, blatantly calling names to South South Korean defense minister and um, with Kim Jong Un's sister and um, Park Jong Chan, who's you know a, a martial a significant military uh, leader within the system, uh, threatening South Korea um, with potential you know warning South Korea about potential you know serious um, consequences if South Korea continues to so-called provoke. Uh, North Korea, with whether it's rhetoric or other means. And so um, we're seeing this both play out in not just what we're observing from you know, the outside, but North Korea's been advertising this dual, I don't want to say dual approach, but um, dual emphasis uh, in their own domestic newspaper, the Norwegian that North Koreans read, of, you know, sprawls pages and pages of Kim Jong Un focusing on welfare of the people at the same time, also reporting and publicizing what the sister and um, the Marshall path has been saying about South Korea uh, and perhaps even trying to show their own people that they're out there gearing up for, you know, some sort of confrontational atmosphere with um, the South. Super, thanks. So I, I want to come to, uh, to Ankit in just a second. He, he may be wondering why he's here at this point. Um, and I, I do want to come to him in, in just a moment. Um, but I, I want to come back real, just real quickly to the sort of bread and circuses um, uh, aspect of, of this. I think um, uh, Andrew and, and Duyon have both gotten to in some ways. Um, uh, you know, to, to what extent um, is this you know, primarily uh, you know, these, the, the, the parades and, and, and the, the more visible elements of uh, the Day of the Sun. To what extent are these um, 
primarily domestic focused and to what extent um, it, you know are these um, events uh, supposed to have uh, a, a, an international dimension as well to what extent are they uh, operating primarily domestically or to what extent are they uh, also meant to send, to send a message uh, you know to Seoul to Beijing to Washington um, to, to the rest of the world sure uh, I, I can go first I mean for me I, I feel like it, there's always this dual um, dual messaging that North Koreans want to send. There's a domestic audience and an international one, but in this particular Day of the Sun uh, celebration, I, I do think the focus is more, and this is my opinion, I think it's more focused on the domestic just because of the hardships that North Koreans are going through. Uh, Kim, uh, Kim Jong-un may want to show or display that, you know, we the North Korean greatness. It's about showing up legitimacy it's with a display of pomp and circumstance. Uh, this includes the military parades, you know, showing up the rockets, the weapons. Um, but, you know, there's also sometimes uh, handouts, extra rations of food, you know, special uh, special types of food that are given on uh, anniversary dates. And so it's, uh, it's a way to, again, remind North Koreans about why their nation is celebrated, why their leader is great. So there's that do domestic value. In terms of the, the international value, or the, it, you know, it can suggest to the to the rest of the world that you, know, you think we might be suffering because of this border lockdown you know, perhaps there's regime instability uh but that's not the case look at us we're continuing to advance forward with our um uh you know our missile and our, and our nuclear capabilities and and we're not backing down so uh if i could be more crude about it, it it's like a it's like a middle finger to uh the rest of the world um but again, again, I feel like this particular celebration will be geared more towards the domestic than the international audience. Super. Yeah, I would completely agree with that assessment. Um, and, and the showing off of the military hardware during the, this particular anniversary, anniversaries celebration, um, I think it, 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 the message it sends to the Koreans is that, you know, even though um, times are tough, and Kim Jong Un has made that explicitly clear. He, he's admitted his economic policies have failed, and so he, you know, he needs to deliver and show that um, the country still is great and, and almighty, like Andrew said. But the military parade also gives um, North Koreans a sense of um, security, a, a feeling of strength, um, and also shows it's a way that the leadership can show their people that we're still strong. We have all this, you know, um, military power and. Um, and, and the narrative has always been that, you know, they're the victims of some sort of U.S. hostility or, or big powers outside of their borders. And so, um, you know, I think that's a very important domestic message that um, often gets overlooked because most often for outside observers um, and researchers, you know, displays of military hardware might just to them, it seems like it's a message to the outside world, and in fact, there's a, a, a big domestic element um, to be achieved there. But it definitely comes in handy to, you know, send out a natural message to um, the outside world as well. You know, they, they kind of, they're able to target multiple objectives uh, in one time. But again, I, I agree with Andrew, I think the, the larger emphasis is domestic. Great. Those are, those are super answers, and I really appreciate it. Um, your, your insight, I think, is right on. I'll just, uh, I think I'm going to bridge now, and since both Dion and Andrew have now brought this up, I'm going to sort of bridge now into beginning to, to talk about some of the things that fit into Ankit's wheelhouse a little bit. Um, I think I'll, I'll bridge that by kind of throwing out a question that is, I'm not even expecting a response for it. It's almost like I'm marking this in our conversation, so perhaps at some point in the future I can come back to it as a research question to look at, or, or more likely give it to someone more competent to answer. Um, I think it's kind of interesting to think about how, uh, in some ways, we um, we think about these North Korean parades as something grotesque, um, and, and in some ways they are. Um, but from your descriptions, some of the functionality of, of these parades and the events is really not so different from when I was a kid, you know, in, in Birmingham, Alabama, going to the 4th of July parade. And, you know, there would be like the, I don't know, the the army reserve would have their, you know, 
their Jeeps, you know, rolling through with like a little flags and the, the veterans associations and stuff. And then, you know, in France, they still have, for instance, a very large military parade that goes down the Champs Elysees and, you know, you know, there are troops marching in front of the, the French president. Um, you know, we know Donald Trump wanted a big parade in the U.S. Apparently it wasn't possible because the tanks were too heavy for the bridges or something like that, um, if I remember correctly. So, you know, I, I can't exactly put my finger on it in terms of what makes the parades in North Korea seem so uh, so much more grotesque than perhaps those we find for domestic propaganda purposes in other countries, in, in, including ones that we would, cons- would con- call democracies. And I guess in some ways that's, I guess, ultimately the, the thing that may be different. These things are inherently different in democracies rather than uh, personalist dictatorships. But um, I think if, if someone hasn't written something about that, I think it might be worth sort of thinking a little bit about how propaganda differs uh, in North Korea versus uh, in, in democracies. In any event, one of the things that definitely is a difference is even in the United States and in France, they don't parade uh, their uh, ICBMs uh, in these uh uh, and these giant celebratory parades, which North Korea, of course, does. Many of these major holidays, inc- as Duyan uh, pointed out, feature military hardware, notably ballistic missiles, um, and especially those connected uh, with North Korea's nuclear weapons program. Um, some of them seem like they may be operational and deployed. Some of them seem like they're under development. Um, what can we expect to see rolled out uh, on this occasion? Uh, what are we looking for that would be of particular interest? Um, what is the satellite imagery showing us? Uh, and here, I think I'll finally bring Ankit into the conversation. Well, great. Well, let me begin, Mason, by thanking you for your generous introduction and for inviting me today into the Asia Society Korea Center. Um, it's always it's always a great question when people ask you to predict what North Korea is going to do, because it's inviting, I think, uh, the North Koreans to really prove you wrong in many ways. Um, but so let me let me begin by saying that you know, let's let's talk about what we're seeing right now. We are observing signs of a major military parade. Preparation is underway at the Marine Parade training grounds outside of Pyongyang. We are seeing uh, temporary shelters being uh, erected to obscure from overhead imagery, large missile launchers, trucks, tanks, and other vehicles. So this is going to be a, a proper uh, day of the sun affair like we saw in uh, 2017 for Kim Il-sung's 105th and in 2012, for the centennial, uh, which was a, a, a huge deal. Um, and, uh, and that was the first time that North Korea paraded a, a mock-up of an ICBM, the, the Hwasong-13, which was never actually flight tested, uh, but it was an important moment for them in uh, showcasing that the founders' aspirations for strategic deterrence were moving forward. Um, a couple other things to point out that I think are interesting in the current setting, uh, not least of which is the COVID-19 pandemic and the fact that it does appear that despite the terrible COVID-19 surges in uh, China's Jilin province bordering North Korea and, of course, South Korea, the North Koreans appear to be undeterred. It does look like that they're going to continue to push ahead with this parade uh, despite the neighboring COVID surges. Uh, and so I think we've been watching for indicators throughout the last two years at the extent to which the North Koreans are responding and modifying the things that they might have otherwise done uh, to pandemic pressures, uh, given that they continue to uh, treat it as a threat to their national survival, as they as they deemed it in January 2020. Um, so we're expecting to see a major parade. The other, the other, I think, interesting variable here is that parades have become quite regularized in North Korea in a way that they hadn't really been under Kim Jong-un. Uh, we saw a parade in October 2020, in January 2021, and in September 2021. And that's a that's a frequency for military parades that I think uh, is abnormal under Kim Jong-un. Parades uh, used to happen on, uh, you know, maybe, maybe with a gap of a few years earlier before that, with major parades in 2012, 2010, uh, 20, or, well, 2020, on, uh, you know, the last major military parade parade under Kim Jong-il, and then uh, in October 2015, which was when they showed off another ICBM design for the first time. Another thing that I would highlight is that the North Koreans um, last October held a self-defense expo, uh, and and that was a remarkable event because it was was in many ways unprecedented. And one of the interpretations that I and others had was that the North Koreans were doing this as sort of a a perhaps a more budget-friendly way to stage a military parade with many of the same external benefits from messaging, right? I mean, budget-friendly in the sense that parades do actually require significant amounts of manpower, 
food, energy, fuel physically for the vehicles to operate in training and during the parade. And so they're not cost-free affairs for the North Koreans. So by doing this self-defense expo, the North Koreans showed off all of their strategic systems, nuclear-capable weapons, things that hadn't yet been tested, including some of the things we saw tested in January 2022, so on and so forth. And so it leaves me wondering about if we're actually going to see anything new at this parade. And I suspect the answer to that is yes, because usually the North Koreans will only use a military parade as an opportunity to at least show us something new. And so when I think about what they might show us, I go back to what Kim Jong-un had to say in January 2021 at the Eighth Party Congress. Uh, he laid out uh, what is the most detailed military modernization speech uh, given by any North Korean leader that I can ever recall, around 12 to 13,000 words, uh, albeit it was a state media paraphrase of a report he delivered over two days at the Party Congress. So he probably had a lot more to say in practice. Uh, but so many of the things that he did say in that speech, uh, we've already been exposed to, either at the self-defense expo or in subsequent testing. Um, the big thing that we haven't been really seen so far is a solid propellant intercontinental range ballistic missile. Uh, the North Koreans have not yet shown us a mock-up of that kind of a weapon, uh, so it might be something that they show us at the parade. Uh, I think that would be entirely in line with past practice. They've used these parades to show us things that might be tested either short after the parade or perhaps even a day or two after the parade. Uh, for instance, in 2017, we saw the Hwasong-12 at the parade uh, at the same time that missile was actually going through some testing in April 2017. It happened to fail in its first few tests. And so we might see that. We might see previously unknown missile types, including new types of liquid-fueled missiles, perhaps an alternative ICBM. Uh, we might see a new submarine launch ballistic missile. Uh, they've shown us two missiles of the Pukuksong family that still haven't been flight tested, the Pukuksong 4 and 5, both of which were first seen at parades. And so there's an opportunity they might show us another system uh, there. Uh, and then there's, I think, a whole number of shorter range and tactical missile systems uh, that they could have reconfigured, uh, put a new coat of paint on that we also might see. So the, the list of possibilities, I think, really goes on and on here. Uh, but I do think the North Koreans are going to show us uh, items of interest and probably things we haven't seen before. Uh, great. Dion, Andrew, if either of you want to jump in on what you might be expecting to, to see in the parades and to the extent that you, you know, have followed you know, reports coming uh, you know, from you know, open sources or you know, satellite imagery or whatever. Anything you want to hop in and say about that? If not, it's fine. I'm just no. No, I think Anke was pretty uh, comprehensive there, so I think we'll let I'll let his words stand. Okay, then then I'll then I'll have a, a follow. I have a couple of follow ups. Then I think to to what uh, to what Anke um, uh, laid out there for us. Um, and the first one is. Uh, you know, as you you mentioned, um, it, North Korea does show us mock-ups uh, of weapons. Um, sometimes, apparently, those that are pretty far from being operational, um, much less um, deployable or deployed. Um, how often did these paraded weapons not end up panning out? Quite frequently. I mean, until until the North Koreans tested the Hwasong-17, uh, which they claim to have tested, there was a little bit of deception, it appeared to have failed. But anyways, they flight tested the Hwasong-17, even if it failed. Until they did that, no ICBM they'd ever, they'd ever shown us at a military parade was actually flight tested. Uh, when the Hwasong-14 and the 15 were tested in 2017, those missiles were new to me and others when they were shown off in, in the state media video footage and imagery. We've never seen those things paraded before. And so, uh, you know, those practices obviously, I think, um, aren't, aren't dispositive of what they might do in the future as the Hwasong 17, I think, attests. They paraded that in October 2020, and they tested that in March 2022. Uh, and, so, and so that might change as well. Um, but generally speaking, uh, you know, I think the North Koreans have gone away from really showing us things that just don't look like practical missiles at all. For instance, in, uh, in, in 2012, when they showed us the Hwasong-13, uh, which was the, a three-stage ICBM that was never flight tested, there were some serious doubts if, if this was even a real missile program at all, that looked like it was a pretty poor mock-up. It was something that they perhaps needed to put together because it was the leader uh, or the founder's centennial, and they wanted to have something remarkable to show off. Uh, Kim Jong-il had just died, and of course, uh, right before his death, he'd 
taken a particular interest in the ICBM program. For instance, it was Kim Jong Il that oversaw the import from China of the um, of the forestry trucks that the North Koreans would later convert into, uh, to carry their ICBMs. And so that that demonstration in 2012, I think, was a was a particular product of of perhaps some of those circumstances. So I wouldn't expect to see the North Koreans show us something um, just ridiculously out of place at this point. Uh, you know, in we might we might you know I think I think people can make the case that in 2017 they did a little bit of that. They showed us, uh, you know, the parade that year crescendoed to these two systems uh, that we've never seen since uh, that were canisterized. Uh, so it was, a, it was a large tube on an ICBM system that implied that they wanted to develop a solid propellant ICBM. You know, those tubes were probably empty at the parade. In fact, they almost certainly were. Um, but it was a way of the North Koreans sort of telling the outside world uh, what their programmatic aspirations were. Because one of those launchers looked remarkably like a Chinese DF-41 or a Russian Topol. And, you know, I think that speaks to the sort of unlimited ambition that the North Koreans have, that they recognize that even though the rest of the world might see them as a, as a small basket case of a country with terrible economic difficulties, that they do have aspirations to practice nuclear deterrence just as the Russians and the Chinese do. And, and they're going to parade missiles that I think look like that they wouldn't be out of place if we saw them in, in Moscow or Beijing. The point that I want to underscore that Antic made um, among many of his good points, but one in particular is, um, you know, when, when he compared them to Chinese and Russian uh, weapon money. So, you know, we're seeing signs and indi indicators that North Korea, you know, they, they're really trying to, whether it's racing towards the finish line or not, but really accelerating um, the pace of developing modern high-tech nuclear weapons that uh, make it look like they are real a genuine nuclear power. Um, on par with the other P5. Uh, and so, you know, he, one, I guess, more, um, one indicator, not just on the technological front here, is they've, it, during Kim Jong Un's rule, they've used the word modern and modernity a lot it's across the board, not just military, but in other sectors of society, but especially in the military realm. Uh, and so it's almost like they kind of want to leap ahead and jump a few stages and really try to aim for the type of weapons that the other big nuclear powers have and that they could also, like Anthony said, receive that type of recognition. Um, and so I, I don't really think that um, their choice of what weapon to test is really an exact science in terms of how they calculate which one to test when. Um, you know, I think they are like there's a trend to you know, leapfrog ahead of the game a bit, or ahead of like what other countries might have actually had in terms of a timeline, um, just to showcase. But you know, the, the whole you know, a lot of people um, might say that you know their failure of you know their failed test, so you know this should be an embarrassment for you North know, But really, it's you know it's not on a technological front. It's not an embarrassment because you know countries have to fail multiple times in order to succeed and perfect the technology of these. Um, missiles and these nuclear weapons, these ICBMs. And so, um, you know, I think that's not just an external political message that they're trying to send, but I think it really is a domestic and internal ambition that they have so that they themselves can call themselves truly a, a so-called genuine nuclear power. Um, but at the same time, they use the word there's some deception in the beginning at, at one point. Um, you know, to show these mock-ups is really, um, you know, uh, indicators for us as observers to see, okay, they may not be there now. This may just be a mock-up, but that's eventually where they want to go. So it's actually a helpful sign for us to prepare, and policymakers in particular in the military, to prepare for what is to come in the future. Uh, when that comes, it's, it's, it's anybody's guess, and we can get a better um, you know, understanding of that. But from a policy perspective, it does help, or well, at least it should help, um, us prepare for what's to come in the future. Uh, Mason, if I can just jump back in real quickly. I mean, uh, just listening to Duyan just reminded me of another point that I wanted to emphasize, which is right now I think we're seeing Kim Jong-un return to what I think was one of his signature initiatives uh, during the 2013 to 2017 missile testing campaign. Uh, you know, some of us call that the Pyongyang campaign 
for, for Kim Jong-un's signature policy at the time. But, you know, Pyongyang was really an idea that he borrowed from his grandfather, right? I think Kim Il-sung gives a speech in 1961 where he uses that phrase, and so it's an older idea. And so I've always thought that if there's anything that's really signature about the way Kim Jong-un approaches his strategic weapons programs, it's really national defense scientists first. He, he really values technical experts and scientists. So this point that Duyan was making about modernity and the emphasis on modernity is, I think, really far-reaching. And so, you know, uh, what I didn't talk about at the Self-Defense Expo was that uh, there were two very large portraits. One was of Kim Jong-un and Park Jong Chung, uh, the vice marshal of the Korean People's Army, uh, who's now just delivered a statement in the last few days, uh, lambasting South Korea's defense minister. Uh, and the other portrait was of Kim Jong Un, flanked by Jang Chang Ha, John Il Ho, and Kim Jong Sik. You know, North Korea's famous missile men. Uh, these are the these are the guys who are, who are seen very commonly at all of these missile tests. You know, screaming launch orders and hugging and celebrating with Kim Jong Un. And so it was it was just really striking to see you know these men really again elevated alongside the leader with these large portraits. And so another purpose that I want to highlight here is that seeing these parades in Pyongyang, right? It's 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 another way to celebrate the accomplishments of this group. Uh, you know, in in 2017 after the successful ICBM tests. Uh, Kim Jong-un, uh, you know, invited the Morangbon band to, you know, play a concert for all of the technicians and scientists who made the ICBM test possible. They were given the best housing on Pyongyang's Romyong Street, which was just inaugurated that year by Kim Jong-un. And so um, the centrality of these figures, I think, is something that, again, will, will loom quite large uh, when this parade does take place. It's that no matter what's, you know, the country is going through a very difficult time, a period of hardship. But in a way, it's sort of a perverse way of justifying to the North Korean people and to the Workers' Party elites in Pyongyang who will be at the parade physically, that it's all worth it because the national defense sector is, is still thriving. Yeah, and that also, that, that just, you know, feeds and fuels in, um, North Korea's intention to, um, you know, instill a sense of pride among North Korean people, the elites, as you know, as it said, the military. Um, and, and in doing that, um, perhaps to try to prevent or, or, or um, you know, lessen the amount of, you know, frustration, complaints, dissent, you know, refugee um, 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 defectors, you know, and all that. And so I mean, it's really, when it comes to North Korea and their objectives, it's, it's very um, comprehensive, holistic. It's, it's never just one objective. They have multiple objectives, and it's, it's like a cobweb of various uh, objectives that they, they want to achieve. Uh, at once or, or, or in a package. Okay, so all of the things that you've been saying recently have sort of like coalesced in, in my mind into sort of three directions. Um, and so I'm hoping that in the remaining 20 minutes or so that we have that, that I can get through those. Um, if I can sort of adumbrate them now, um, I think the first one um, uh, would be going back to this um, uh, uh, notion of deception, um, which uh, Ankit um, uh, brought up. Um, you know, we know from March 24th um, that what North Korea, or sorry, I should say, we strongly conjecture <laughs> based off of pretty good evidence, apparently, um, uh, that the March 24th uh, Hwasong 17 launch was not, in fact, a Hwasong 17 launch, that instead it was a Hwasong 15, um, and that the there was imagery that was used from the failed launch on the 16th um, in order to to make it seem like the 17th uh, the launch on the 24th was a, a 17. Um, you know, does this um, and should this dent the belief uh, in the credibility of North Korea's ICBM nuclear deterrent? Um, if North Korea has lied about this. Uh, in an apparently ham-fisted fashion, um, can and should we believe that North Korea has a reliable reentry vehicle, compact warheads, a reasonably functional navigation and guidance system for putting its missiles on target? And I simply, I, you know, I, I talk about that since you, you know, we, we talked about, you know, mock-ups and, and weapons that don't end, end up working out. And then, you know, the 17th, te the test of the 17 on the 24th and, and uh, sorry, uh, on the 16th seemingly didn't work out. Um, so th that's a question I'd like to throw out there. Uh, a second one is, uh, you know, something I think for all three of you, um, if, you if you would be interested in commenting uh, on how these uh, parades uh, are, have really changed the game, uh, notably through, for instance, us being able to, to access them in advance through um, satellite imagery. 
uh, in terms of uh, using open source intelligence um, to, to help us understand um, what North Korea is doing and, and what it's planning. And then the third uh, thing I want to throw out there um, is uh, you know, a question about how attuned right now Washington, D.C. is to North Korea. Uh, with everything happening in, in Ukraine, um, you know, it's easy on this side of the world to think that perhaps the, the White House is distracted and that this is a sort of permissive condition um, for some of North Korea's um, uh, uh, more nefarious activities. And I think in particular, I'd like to ask Andrew that one since, uh, uh, since he's in Washington at, at Brookings, um, which I'm sure has a direct line into the, into the Oval Office. Um, and so perhaps we could you know, get some idea from you, Andrew, about you know, how much attention right now uh, in the national security uh, community in the U.S. Uh, is being paid uh, to North Korea. So those are the sure. three things I want to throw out there. You can, any of the three of you can handle any of those um, three sets of points. Okay, Andrew, I'll, you want to I'll kick take, off? Sure. I'll, I'll take the Ukraine question first, and then I'll give a few brief comments about uh, the, the doctor, the fake imagery of the Hussing 17 launch. And, you know, if, if Brookings does have a, a direct line to the White House, which I'm sure they do, they haven't shared that with me yet. But I, I know that there are uh, many former colleagues who are, are up, who are up there right now. But we have been talking uh, quite a bit just among my colleagues about the Ukraine situation and what that means for the Indo-Pacific, what it means for the, uh, what it means for North Korea uh, as well. Uh, the Biden administration's attention is certainly oriented towards Europe at the moment. And, you know, I'd say it does work to Pyongyang's advantage that the U.S. and the international community is focused so intensely on the Ukraine. However, I'm, I'm of the belief that North Koreans or North Korea, they march to their own drumbeat. Most likely, North Korea is trying to boost its own military capabilities, thereby enhancing its own security and or... Uh, possibly increasing its bargaining leverage against the United States in any future negotiations. So uh, to me, I think North Koreans would have conducted missile tests, including an ICBM test, even without the Ukraine crisis. And we have to remember, we saw the uptick in missile tests begin from last August. So that's uh, in some ways that predates uh, the real, I mean, there's always been uh, tensions with Ukraine and, and Russia, especially since 2014. But before we saw the you know, the troop mobilization of Russia along Ukraine's border, we were still seeing, uh, we saw the, the uptick in, in missile tests happening before then. So yes, uh, the U.S., the international community is distracted, but North Korea is going to do what it wants to do um, regardless. They just have the advantage now of everyone being distracted. And let me just get to your first uh, question about the the fake images. And, you know, in some ways, you know, my response is similar to how Tuyan and Ankit responded about the, the mock-ups. And uh, yeah, even though these might, uh, these might be uh, fake images, you know, we, on, on one hand, we shouldn't really be surprised that North Koreans tend to embellish their capabilities and their accomplishments, um, including uh, likely the last ICBM test. But, the regime's missile capabilities, uh, you know, even even if they haven't advanced to the, the to the degree that North Koreans claim that it has, it doesn't take away from the fact that North Korea has tested and will continue to test and perfect its long range missile capabilities. And because of that, I think we should take any missile launch or attempted missile launch seriously. So I, I I don't want to suggest that 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 I'm not taking it seriously. I, somewhere in the back of my head, the the I don't know the the fearful part of me uh, mm -hmm. is just a little bit afraid that you know someone um, might come into office rhymes mm -hmm. with Trump uh, in in 2025 uh, after winning an election in 2024 um, and. And maybe some of the people surrounding him uh, would think, oh, you know, the last time they fired off an ICBM, you know, it exploded in the air and then they they faked imagery later. You know, we don't think that their North Korea, that North Korea's deterrent is credible. And, you know, the the bloody nose strike doctrine is resurrected um, because well, maybe there's a sense that they're that their ICBMs aren't all that they're cracked up to be. And I'm not saying that's right. I think that's a fear that I have, if you want to put it that way. So. Well, 
Mason, if I can jump in, I mean, I think I think that's I think that's a, a well placed fear to have. You know, we have transcripts, uh, a leaked transcripts of uh, President Trump telling Rodrigo Duterte that you know that Kim Jong Un guy in North Korea don't his mission and don't his missiles keep crashing all the time. Uh, you know, so yes, I mean, if there is that assumption, uh, you know, the U.S. would might be might be motivated to attack. Let's just say. Um, look, I mean, the only thing I'll say, I think the most interesting question about the deception is not did they deceive us. I think I think the balance of evidence. Uh, you know, m- my belief is with a fairly high level of confidence that they did deceive us. Um, The question is, why did they feel the need to do that? Uh, Because the North Koreans are smart enough to know that the U.S. has infrared satellites that can almost instantly tell the difference between a a Hwasong-17 and a Hwasong-15. And we have optical satellite. President Trump even tweeted out an image of a classified American reconnaissance satellite uh, that took a picture of an Iranian launch. So the North Koreans know that it's, it's, it's you can't fool the United States with your state media uh, you know, show. And actually, I mean, some of the video footage they even re- uh, released actually shows uh, the engine uh, of the missile, uh, the Hwasong 17 launching, uh, having a few difficulties, actually. And so, you know, it's it's not a very convincing um, way to deceive us. And, and, and you're absolutely right for that, for the purposes of strategic nuclear deterrence, especially for a smaller country like North Korea and an asymmetric deterrence relationship, uh, you normally wouldn't want to lie about those kinds of things. Kim Jong-un was open when the satellite launch failed in April 2012, for instance. He said that, you know, this launch failed, but we'll get it right the next time. Um, and so all this brings me to, you know, my answer to why they felt the need to to carry out this elaborate deception. And the reason I keep coming back to is that it was a domestic uh, it was a domestic thing for them. Uh, and I think, you know, again, you look around North Korea, uh, everything is going poorly uh, around the country. The only thing that's really going well is the missile program. And so a missile failure, especially a prominent missile failure over the national capital uh, could be disastrous, especially for that. You know, I tend to believe in selectorate theory when it comes to how Kim Jong-un keeps his regime happy. And so when you have your workers' party elites and the most elite families in North Korea look up to the sky and see a very large missile fail over their heads, um, you want to give them perhaps a reason to think not everything is bad, that that we are moving ahead. Uh, and so they carry out this deception and the way it's presented internally, I think, very much speaks to that, especially with the KCTV and, and the Noah Shinman sort of page one treatment of, of the successful Hwasong 17 test. Um, but to get back to your other question, you know, on on what this should tell us about North Korea. Look, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I'm not saying that you believe this, but I think absolutely the, the wrong lesson to take away from a single ICBM failure would be that, you know, North Korea's nuclear deterrent is a paper tiger. Uh, you know, exactly the same number of North Korean and U.S. ICBMs have failed since 2017. You know, I mean, that's just a, a little bit of a tongue in cheek point. But, you know, it's to make the point that there's no such thing as a perfect missile system. Uh, missiles, missiles fail in, in testing. And even the North Koreans, I think, when they think about nuclear deterrence, uh, I think they think about it very probabilistically. They, they think about the threat that leaves something to chance. Uh, and they, I think, believe that they can deter the United States, even at very low levels of reliability. And so, you know, it, it, it's tempting for American engineers uh, at, at, you know, who, who work on U.S. defense systems to make the case that no weapon system can be considered reliable until it's been tested hundreds of times and, and validated with incredibly sophisticated diagnostics. But all the North Koreans need to do is to give an American president reason to think twice, three times, four times before authorizing an attack on North Korean territory or on Kim Jong-un. And I think even an ICBM that's succeeded three out of four tests, 75 percent hit rate isn't too bad. And you can factor in, you know, how often a reentry vehicle might fail and so forth. And maybe you get to slightly lower probabilities, but even a 10 percent, 5 percent, 1 percent chance of the North Korean nuclear warhead going off on New York City or Los Angeles or Washington, D.C. Uh, is, I think, enough to uh, yield significant deterrence benefits in, uh, in many ways. Fair enough. Do you want to jump in? Yeah. I, so the only things that I would add um, is on the deception question, um, It's also not surprising in terms of, so we've seen certain parallels in other countries too. Um, Other developing countries uh, along the trajectory of their country's development. Um, And I'll just name one example. In the non-military sphere, let's look at South Korea. After the Korean War and and as the country was developing, there were a lot of areas within the economy, the sector of society where, um, you know, the, the external image uh, was far more ahead of the internal development of whatever they were trying to achieve. So they, they wanted to show that they were modern and yet the internal workings of whatever that structure was or whatever that you know building was, it, it wasn't really, or the system just wasn't really there yet. And so 
there is, we have seen these tendencies for developing countries too, and to show off something more externally, even though, you know, the substance hasn't caught up to the image and the perception of them. Um, but here there is a, you know, a, a policy ramification element too. Uh, and this ties into, you know, it's something that Anthony was mentioning, but, you know, it's a whole notion of you know, the, the, the delicate balancing act from a policy perspective in the outside US, Africa, Japan, and others um, between underestimating and overestimating North Korea's nuclear capability. Uh, and so, you know, if, if obviously, you know, if you underestimate because you've seen certain failures in their uh, weapons tests, um, then, it, you know, the, the risk of danger there is not being prepared for, and so not only waking up one day to find that they have very advanced. Um, develop weapons uh, and not being prepared for that. Um, or and on the flip side, if we you know if we overestimate then US Africa Japan could actually overreact in how they deal with uh, and respond to, to North Korea. And so um, that's one aspect. Um, the other, you know, to, to answer your other question about um, the United States preparation for occupation, uh, you know, I, I see the latest North Korean tests and, and future ones to come, um, as perhaps North Korea thinks that it is safe to test ICBMs right now, perhaps even a nuclear test going forward, because Washington is so preoccupied uh, with Russia and Ukraine. Uh, safe meaning perhaps that you know they think they can do it without inviting severe penalty to the international community. Um, but that is still, you know, with a, a, a largely a, my assessment is that the main objective is really domestic, right? So they've got this military imperative to achieve all the, to make all these weapons that Kim Jong-un will order them to make that is a part of Congress. And so regardless of what happens outside of the borders, regardless of what, you know, some what Andrew said, what, it doesn't matter if we had a um, Ukraine invasion or not. I think, mean, you know, they've got the domestic challenge on their schedule that they need to keep to and the milestones that they need to achieve. Uh, and so, you know, regardless of whether there was a progressive South Korean president elected this time around, or, you know, whoever sits in the White House, you know, I think um, they would still continue with nuclear business as usual. They might um, make certain tweaks along the way in terms of whether it's timing or, or, or whatnot, depending on the political and security circumstances with their neighbors and the United States. But, um, in the grand scheme of things, I think they're, they're set to just keep moving forward with their plans. Super. Yeah, those are all um, excellent comments that, that I think really go to the heart of, of this uh, three questions um, that, that, that I asked following your last round of, of comments. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping to get us out of here in five to seven minutes. Um, but I, 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 I want to, first of all, say something that just sort of ran through my head here, which is, um, you know, one of the things I think that's sort of thematically coming out of this conversation is the tension between what North Korea needs domestically um, versus um, you know how it operates uh, with respect you know to to the international community, whether that be you know the United States or, or China or the United Nations or or other places uh, and international actors. And there's you know obviously something you know pathological um, about North Korea and this tension. It's sort of abnormal that it has to have these domestic imperatives, which then imperil some of its um, international aims. Um, <clears throat> and kind of what made me think about that was, uh, you know, we, we've used the word deception to talk about this imagery from the 24th. And it makes me think of the, the French word deception, which means actually it's a false friend. It's a false cognate. It actually means disappointment um, in French. And it's kind of interesting that this deception in English language, you know, this, this fakery for North Korea was a disappointment, um, you know, and to some degree that, that disappointment that it had a, because of something internal, you know, produced this sort of odd um, reaction from the international community where we all looked at this, you know, missile that blew up and, and asked them why they would have told a, a fake story about, you know, why this missile was shot into the air under uh, false pretenses. Um, so we've talked about parades, we've talked about missiles, we've talked about domestic propaganda. Um, I think the thing I want to kind of finish up with um, here is uh, the speculation about an upcoming seventh nuclear test. 
uh, you know, we know around uh, these holidays, um, it's not just uh, parades and, and showing off uh, the systems, um, but sometimes they are tested. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, some of the, the development that North Korea is interested in, in uh, advancing its uh, nuclear weapons program isn't just the delivery vehicles, um, but also uh, the warheads uh, themselves. Uh, and of course, we haven't even talked about the production of the necessary fissile material, but we can only do so much uh, in the amount of time we have. Um, what might North Korea be looking to do um, with the seventh nuclear test? Um, do you expect this test to take place uh, by or around, let's say, the 15th? Or is that time frame likely too short, um, given the uh, supposed problems with the Pungiri tunnels, um, which were partially um, detonated uh, a few years ago. Uh, Andrew, in particular for you, what is Washington expecting um, from this and what might its reaction be, uh, given that it seems unlikely that there would be uh, much of a possibility for United Nations Security Council resolutions, uh, given the situation uh, between the US and uh, Russia uh, over the Ukraine situation? So those are sort of my final sets of questions, and I'll let you kind of handle those in any order you want. Maybe maybe you want to start with Anket. You could perhaps speculate on the the likelihood of uh, an upcoming seventh test and what the time frame for that might be. Sure. So, look, in November 2017, Kim Jong Un declared his deterrent complete. He wasn't being literal. He just meant that the basic qualitative markers for strategic nuclear deterrence against the United States had been accomplished. And then in January 2021, uh, he started talking about tactical nuclear weapons for the first time. You know, uh, before that, when the North Koreans would talk about tactical nuclear weapons, it was usually to make the point that the U.S. actually hadn't pulled its tactical nuclear weapons out of Korea. The North Koreans never acknowledged that American tactical nuclear weapons left South Korea when they did in December 1991. And so that brings me to, I think, the pretty logical conclusion here, which is that a seventh North Korean nuclear test is probably going to be a test of a low yield compact tactical nuclear weapon, probably something that they can put on a system like the CAN-25 or maybe even something smaller. Uh, the CAN-25 being a 600 millimeter uh, rocket artillery system that they've, uh, well, short range ballistic missile, depending on how you want to characterize it. Um, and then, yes, I think the most interesting question is, uh, given the state of great power geopolitics right now with Russia and China, uh, still talking about North Korea's legitimate security interests. That is still what China's special representative is saying, even as we have these news reports of Punggye being reconstituted. Um, will the North Koreans see another UN Security Council resolution condemning this, or will this be the first nuclear test by a country to have left the NPT in the 21st century to not be met with uh, you know, unanimous condemnation at the UN Security Council? I don't know the answer to that question, but I think we'll find out soon enough. Andrew? Sure. On the likelihood of, of the seventh nuclear test, I mean, I, I think Ankit spoke to the type of test we might expect, but I think there is an expectation in Washington that a seventh nuclear test may be coming soon. It may be fitting, of course, if you could time it around the day of the sun, uh, you would have the ultimate fireworks or you know, the birthday would go, uh, celebration would uh, go out with a bang. Uh, no, uh, yes, pun intended there. But uh, yeah, there is that expectation. I think that's why we're seeing Washington, despite all that's happening with Ukraine and Russia, uh, you know, the on, you know, special envoy, Sung, Sung Kim, you know, he's reaching out uh, with, you know, Japan, counterparts in Japan and Korea. There have been discussions in the last few weeks. Uh, uh, the Yon, uh, Yonhap News Agency reported that the Chinese uh, envoy to North Korea uh, was or is, is, is coming to Washington for, for some discussions as well, too. Maybe just, uh, and, and all of this may be uh, within the pretense that, North Korea may be launching a nuclear test and what, what should the response be? Um, I actually think China may be more open to being constructive here because the, you know, they, they're being very careful after what happened with Russia and you know, everyone's kind of watching what China will do next. And you know, if maybe this may be one way to salvage some sort of relationship with the international community, but in terms of Russia uh, signing up for UN uh, sa uh, you know, sanctions or something, kind of response with a resolution. I'm not really sure. So uh, as Ankit mentioned, we're going to find out soon enough. But um, yeah, I, I, I hate to be skeptical. Uh, uh, I hate to be making this prediction. But, but yes, I think we're going to see a seventh nuclear test uh, soon. 
great. Dion, you want to take the final minute and that'll take us to roughly an hour and then uh, we'll close things down. Sure, so very um, briefly, uh, some of the nuclear test if North Korea feels the need fundamentally technologically to do one, um, but also it would achieve a political gain or objective as well, the message um, to the outside world too. So if it needed to, if it felt technologically had to either to continue to miniaturize or, or find certain aspects, then um, I think they would go ahead and do it. In terms of um, you know the U.S. response, you know it, it's I I would not be surprised if um, U.S. South Korea decided together to you know redeploy certain U.S. strategic assets, do more bomber flyovers and, and whatnot um, in in response. Uh, depending on when a nuclear test is conducted, whether it's anytime soon this month or um, sometime during the new conservative, South Korean conservative UN administration, um, you know, that's again another factor in the equation of what type of response the allies would want to uh, make. Uh, I, I do know that some of President elect Lee Sung Yar's advisors, who most likely will be going into the new administration, they would want to see um, a tougher response to even ICBM tests, if I mean, whatever North Korea does those. Um, for example, we deploy strategic assets for ICBM tests too, in response to ICBM tests too. Um, in terms of China, Russia, yes, I agree. It's anyone's guess. If history is any guide for China, I think nuclear test is pretty much you know, a red line for China. So you know, if history is a guide, we might see China try to um, do something in response at the Council, at the Security Council. But again, uh, considering the state of play, of the ge geopolitical state of play, um, between and among, you know, China versus U.S. and China Russia versus U.S. You know, again, here I join my colleagues in saying it really it remains to be seen. We'll have to see how we do this. Super. Thank you very much for for bringing us down very succinctly um, and with. Uh, just a slight tinge of depression there at the end um, with respect to the geopolitics. Uh, so on behalf of the Asia Society uh, Korea, uh, I want to thank uh, Anke Panda uh, from Carnegie, uh, Andrew Yo from Brookings, uh, and Dion Kim from uh, the Center for New American Security uh, for joining us uh, on our webinar on uh, rocket red glare, Kim Il-sung in the air. Uh, and what to expect uh, for the April 15th Day of the Sun celebration. Uh, I hope that you learned something, uh, and thanks for joining us. See you next time.